All right, I think we're right at 2 o'clock. So go ahead and get started. All right, perfect. So uh, first off, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Elder. I'm a senior technical staff member with IBM. I've worked in product development now for going on eight or 10 years. And over the last three or four years, we've been looking at DevOps, cloud, continuous delivery, things like that, and trying to understand how to help our clients do that better. So today, I want to talk about what we uh, have been doing in the space with OpenStack, both using heat and virtual images, as well as experimenting with how we do that with containers, um, and then how we you know, extend that even in, into platforms like Cloud Foundry. I'm also going to be joined by Tan, who's going to be helping me out with the Magna part. So I'll let Tan introduce yourself when, when we start. Is it? We'll introduce later. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in. So ultimately, what we see with cloud and DevOps <clears throat> driven mostly by the kind of the, the expectations of the consumer. It's a very different kind of world than we were a decade ago. I think you'll see hundreds of slides that look like this. I just want to kind of drive the point home that the rate of software delivery is continually increasing to keep up with market and consumer demands. But the challenges there are still this sort of bifurcation that has existed between the development and the operations teams, largely siloed, largely due to you know, historical concerns, executive leadership, things like that, that have treated them as separate parts of a larger problem when really we see t uh, organizations that start pulling these, these teams together being more effective. And while cloud, I think, helps, right, it doesn't necessarily provide a silver bullet to fixing the, the collaboration problem between development and operations. But ultimately, we think with automation and standardization, we can start approaching more of that. When we look at cloud, I think there is at least three different categories of different kinds of things you can deploy into cloud. And I like to kind of call them out to kind of set some context. The first, I think everyone at this conference is going to be very familiar with providing infrastructure as a service, being able to use virtual machines and automation to put together a complete environment and then use that for the development or test of your application. One of the things that we continually, continuously see is this sort of uh, spectrum between having a very bare metal, minimal image that everything is automated on top of, all the way to the other end of the spectrum where we actually build a virtual machine and snapshot it, and that sort of becomes the artifact that we carry through the, de the actual deployment process. Container-based deployments are really not, in my opinion, they're not really true infrastructure as a service or platform as a service, because you don't really get IaaS with a container. You don't really get PaaS, right? You're still building the container. You're still specifying all the details of your platform within the container. But it allows you to more easily encapsulate the concerns of the application and separate those from the concerns of the operation side of the house. But it also may require a different way of managing the architecture of your application. Right? We typically see Docker containers work really well for microservices. If you're adapting sort of a very stateful kind of workload, it may not work as well. Right? And so this starts to drive home something that, that we've observed that there's probably not one single infrastructure as a service or container as a service type of, of model, but perhaps really sort of a blend. And I think as you get into platform as a service, you start to see more of that. Right. I think everyone looks at Cloud Foundry and other platform as a service technologies as a great way to do certain kinds of applications, right? Things that are very engaging for the user, things that have to change and keep up with the pace of expectations more quickly, but you're probably not going to move your checking and financial systems over to platform as a service. Those will probably continue to remain maybe traditional IT or maybe start to use infrastructure as a service, maybe start to use some container as a service type stuff. But the point that I want to make here is really that cloud offers many different uh, types of technologies to help you drive greater automation and help drive your deployment pipeline. And you're probably not going to pick just one. You're probably going to pick a mixture. And so we're trying to account for how do you deal with that challenge of many different kinds of deployment models against your cloud environment. So in my particular area within IBM, we focus on DevOps. And so Urban Code as a company was actually acquired and brought into IBM several years ago. And when we look at DevOps, though, one of the key things we see is that there's sort of three simple questions, right? What are you going to deploy? How are you going to deploy it? And where are you going to deploy it? And for each of those three pillars that we saw earlier, you can ask each of those questions and answer them. They're not, uh, like I said before, I think ultimately you still have to account for how you do delivery regardless of which kind of a pillar you choose. And so what do I mean by that? So if we look today at sort of the, the organizational model, we typically see 
applications having been optimized with greater automation than we do the infrastructure layer. Right? That's where infrastructure as a service hopefully begins to address some of that challenge. And we've seen that problem optimized where applications can be developed in more agile uh, ways. They can have more fine-grained updates that are kind of continuously made to them over time. And we can get to the point where we're continuously deploying those applications against maybe existing physical systems. But below the line, if you're not leveraging infrastructure as a service, you're not leveraging a cloud-based delivery model, you're still more traditional IT, we often still see very long, complicated manual life cycles. And even when you start to adopt virtualization in cloud, we often see clients actually still have a ticketing system in front of it. So for instance, if I can ask the question today, in your organizations, how many of you use cloud or virtualization to some extent? Okay, and how many of you actually have access to go and do a self-service request of that cloud infrastructure versus having to go and file a service ticket, waiting for a human to go and run the virtualization, stand it up, and still manually configure it? So how many of you have access to that kind of self-service? So actually, a pretty good number compared to other conferences that I've seen, but I think the challenge is still a lot of manual process that's still using sort of virtualization, but still... Um, not as, as optimized as it could be. And so what we see with technologies like Heat or Docker Compose or, or even the kind of manifest format from Cloud Foundry is this opportunity to begin encapsulating all of those different resources into a set of artifacts. And so these roles that were traditionally working through an administrative type of process to configure new systems or deploy new software now become roles that are really operating around a set of artifacts. They can file defects against them. They can version control them. And while before you start introducing cloud, things on the right look very different, right? Hardware versus platforms versus actual business applications. Because they look different, they were managed differently. But as you start to convert over to a fully software-defined infrastructure, whether that's IaaS or containers or platform as a service, then you can start to manage them all in a more consistent fashion. And I think this is really the promise and also, I think, the challenge of how we leverage cloud to deliver better software over time. So what we've been looking at is how do we enable our clients, who may have been focused already on the DevOps problem with sort of traditional IT, to begin to take advantage of cloud in more efficient ways. And so we want to be able to leverage technologies like Heat, and I'm going to show you some live examples of what I mean by that, to create full stacks that actually are composed of many different kinds of resources, virtual images, uh, software-defined networking, uh, actual storage, object storage, block storage. And then we've also begun to extend the heat engine to understand other things like our own notion of how we manage software deployment. Also, Amazon's notions of things like S3, which we can make compatible with Swift, or Elasticache, or relational databases as a service and we'll see those additional kinds of resources coming into play. And so what I think is interesting is that when we look at a stack, it may not be all of one kind of thing, like all infrastructure as a service. If I start dropping resources that deal with Elasticache or relational databases as a service or these other things next to it, right? That, that sort of drives home this idea that applications are going to be blended together through many different technologies, not sort of you know, siloed. So once we create these stacks, then the idea would be to assemble them into multi-tier uh, scalable environments. Now, what I think is interesting is that, you know, is anyone familiar with Conway's Law? All right, a few people. So back in the 1980s, this guy named Conway came up with this idea that architecture follows organizational structure. So if your organization has a four-team organization to deliver a compiler, then you're going to end up with a four-pass compiler. And so I think when we look at artifacts, and we look at the kind of artifacts we're going to assemble, it's just sort of the, the physics of it. If you have database engineers and web engineers and, and networking engineers, they're all going to create the artifacts that are specific to their level of expertise. And then you're going to have some level of integrators. And in the picture, you know, we had this notion of the integrators and the specialists. Almost every organization I talk to has a different label for these things, but they almost always have these roles. Right? A specialist is someone who knows something very deep, but not very broadly. And then an integrator is simply someone who pulls all the pieces together, but really doesn't know how any one thing works. Right? They just know how they plug together. And so the artifacts that we start defining for these, these software-defined environments 
I think will ultimately reflect that organizational structure that you have today, right? If you've got several siloed teams around those different functions, then they're gonna create artifacts specific to their functions, and then we're gonna pull them together. And then ultimately, what we've tried to bring to the technology that's in OpenStack is this focus around portability, right? I think that's something that if you look at Heat today, it works really well for OpenStack. How can we leverage the things we like about that language? Very open, very community-driven. Um, actual people can contribute code to it or help influence the direction of it. It's not influenced by a single vendor. But also leverage that in a way that we can create templates that are portable between OpenStack or Amazon or SoftLayer or other cloud environments. And in fact, we've even built content to support native VMware simply because many of our clients have native VMware and may not be ready to move to cloud. Right? When we leave the OpenStack Summit, while we have a lot of passion here, there are still many people that are way further back than we really think they should be. But we want to help pull them forward. All right. And so this is going to be sort of the, the first part of, of what we'll kind of focus in on is looking at how do we create heat templates that actually can be deployed across many different technologies. With an IBM, we obviously have Bluemix, which has support for Cloud Foundry, Docker, and virtual images. Within, uh, we also, I'll show you an example of deploying to Amazon, different on-premises cloud technologies, and then understanding how that works across each stage of your deployment pipeline. And that's another thing I'll show you as well, is how that notion of software delivery is not simply stand it up one time, but actually manage it in an ongoing fashion in the running environment. So, in fact, let me, well here, I'll kind of do a quick preview and then we'll kind of jump into the live part. So this is Urban Code Deployed Patterns. This is actually built, this is a web-based editor built on top of Heat, right? Each of the objects and figures that you see correspond to a Heat resource that's back in the template. We can move between a diagram and a source-based view. All of the elements in the palette are actually being read from the OpenStack API. So virtual images, networking, storage, et cetera, are all things that we're being discovered <clears throat> and can be used to create the final template. We're also layering in the concept of an application and understanding what environments the application has. And we can create new environments for these applications. And then from here, provide all of the parameters that would be exposed from the heat template. So what we actually see here are things like availability zone, the image flavors, et cetera. And we'll see we have some content assist to help track those down as well. So when we provision an, a template, we might be targeting it for soft layer, in which case we would provide soft layer specific information and feedback or Amazon. And so I think what's one of the things that we've really tried to focus on is that regardless of which cloud target you're hitting, you're able to get lots of feedback and help and guidance and syntax highlighting around that. We've also extended the heat resources that are available. So how many people are generally familiar with the concept of heat and heat plugins today? So actually good, a lot of good hands. So the net of that is that today the heat engine itself can be extended through plugins. And as good community citizens, our goal to help clients leverage that technology is not to fork it or change it in a way that's not compatible with the open source, but simply leverage the plugin mechanism to create new value on top of it. And so some of the things that we've created include things like ElastiCache. So ElastiCache provides a common caching as a service capability on Amazon supporting uh, Memcached as well as Redis, supporting object storage. We've designed some of these pieces like the virtual machines, like the networking, like the object storage in a way that they're compatible. So a template that describes object storage and heat can be deployed against Amazon for S3 or Swift if you're using OpenStack. Same thing for VMs, same thing for networks. And then relational database as a service, being able to define either a MySQL or PostgreSQL database backend for your application. And of course, those are also exposed in the palette, discovering that information from the Amazon environment. The other thing we focused in on was looking at how do we provide simple versioning to people that, so one of the things that was kind of surprising to me, maybe not too surprising, but one of the things that will surprise some people is the fact that in, in many operation circles, if you're not already kind of at the edge of understanding software-defined networks or software-defined environments, source control doesn't exist, right? In, in the broader community, it really doesn't exist. So how do you expose things like Git as a source control system for templates in a way that doesn't require me to learn a lot of very sort of arcane Git command line syntax? We may all love Git, but 
You know, we've all kicked it a few times too, I'm sure. Um, and the net of it is that we can actually expose all of this directly in the web browser, see the various repositories, see the history, and see the comparisons as part of the tool. So with that, let's actually switch over and show some of this live. So what we're looking at is actually the, the capability we're talking about, urban code deployed patterns. In the diagram editor, in this example, we have the route table, we have the network, we have virtual images, we have components. For each of these things, again, it's simply backed by a heat resource type. But what you'll notice is that the way that we've leveraged the heat architecture allows us to create additional properties on top of it so that we understand not only the OpenStack pieces, but also other pieces, for instance, Amazon or SoftLayer or native VMware. And the idea here was to make it easy to, to create content either from the text editor or from the diagram editor. And as I move between these various things, the focus between them is, is kept in sync. So here I can kind of click back and forth without uh, a lot of trouble. Because what we find is that most of the roles that are engaged in creating these things, depending on whether they fit into that integrator category or the specialist category, they either want a very high level overview or they want to be down in the weeds, right? There's really no kind of in the middle. So our goal was to try to support both models of working without a lot of changes. So in this example, by default, in this example, we, I just happen to have it connected to Amazon, we can list all the various regions. We present these in much the same way that you would see Keystone regions. If I select our OpenStack cloud, we have one region defined in that that's also deployed in the software environment. All of the content here on the right are things I think you'll hope you'll recognize. The images, the networks, and the security. All of this is actually coming from my Amazon account, and it will change based on which Amazon account I'm connected to. On the left, we have a rich tree view that makes it easy to navigate. How many of you created heat templates by hand? How many people thought that was an awesome, wonderful user experience? <laughs> OK, one guy in the back. So you rock. But for me, I found it kind of a, you know, I've been in software for a long time. And all of the kind of things like linking up IDs or, or parameters, I wanted to know right away that there was a problem if the parameter didn't exist. Or you know, I'm working against several different clouds. So what happens if my type isn't defined in that particular OpenStack environment? So the goal immediately, very quickly in the web browser is to provide that kind of feedback and syntax highlighting. Things like undo, redo work like you would expect. So I can undo any kind of editing, whether it's in the source editor or the diagram editor. It's very easy to find things very quickly. right? So here, if I'm looking for things that start with JKE, and then I can either drag this into the text view or the diagram view. Now, in this case, the other thing I want to actually show you is this running live. And part of what you'll see is that we're not simply provisioning the content against the cloud, but we're also provisioning the software. And for this, we're bringing in a product called Urban Code Deploy with patterns that allows us to see our application. And this application is made up of various components. And those components know their versions. They know how to be installed. And of course, they're exposed in the palette as well. So let's go ahead and kick off a deployment against Amazon. And I have noticed the Wi-Fi is a little bit shoddy when this, this dialog first comes up. So apologies for the, uh, the delay. So here we have a database image. We're going to pick our flavor. Here the list is showing me all content from, uh, from Amazon. In a moment, we'll see it from OpenStack. We're going to pick a default gateway ID. We'll pick the SSH key to deploy against it. And then we've already got images selected for the web image and the database image. We'll click on provision. As this kicks off, it's actually executing calls down into the heat engine, creating that request to do a heat stack create. But instead of creating OpenStack resources, it's actually going to be creating Amazon types. And we can do this for different clouds, but I show this because most people are looking at Amazon and OpenStack together. We can kind of see this view, which is more or less a kind of cleaned up view of the heat stack list. But we can also switch over to our, our application and get a much nicer presentation of what's going on. So I can see this request is currently running. And as I click into it, I'm going to get a, a breakdown of everything that's part of the template. And as I dig into the servers, I'm going to see all of the different pieces of software and their associated processes as they run, which gives you a much nicer view of what's going on, what's your total elapsed time, 
I think, easier than using the heat stack command line for sure. Um, not that there's anything wrong with it, but it just provides a bit more feedback there. Now let me go back. I'm going to switch over to OpenStack. So here I change my cloud target, much in the way that you might shift the region or the project you're working on inside of Horizon. Now this is the same template. No magic. I haven't changed anything there. Um, in the source, again, it's all the same heat resource types. When I click on provision now, because, in fact, you may have noticed as well, things like the images are uh, presented based on what's my OpenStack cloud. Um, but because I've pointed to the OpenStack target, I'm now going to get feedback from OpenStack. So I'll see flavors that are OpenStack flavors. I'll see the images from my OpenStack catalog. And so what's neat is that the template can be parameterized such that it's portable. right? I can use it across not only different OpenStack environments, but different, completely different cloud technologies as well. All right, so we'll go ahead and click on provision for that. And I didn't change the name here at the top, so we'll just remember that this one's the OpenStack example, unless I already have one provision with that name, in which case I'll get that feedback here. Ah, so here let me pick a new image. And here we'll go ahead and change this name. Actually, I've already got a predefined configuration file. So in this example, when we are talking to a particular kind of cloud, we can capture its configuration in a way that makes it easy to link up. And so it's made some default selections for me. Some things I still can override. So substituting in different things like the network. Actually, no, I apologize. That's the wrong configuration. Let me drop out of that. And instead, we'll just go to what the defaults there. All right, cool. So I'll kick that off. Now, over in my environment for the application, I'm going to see the Amazon example, which is coming online. And I'm going to see the other environment here uh, that's provisioned to OpenStack. If I go over to my Amazon console, I'll actually see these virtual machines that are coming online from a moment ago. And not only did we create the virtual machines, which are currently initializing here, we also created all of the other network content as well. So if I break out to my network layer, so we actually define several security groups as well. In fact, here, what I can want to show you is down here. So all of the different subnets that are required, um, whatever the subnet ranges are, and the entire VPC itself are defined as part of this process. In OpenStack, when I actually go and view the instances, we'll see the same kind of networks provisioned out here as well. So here are the ones that we'll see come online here in a minute. Actually, and I think my uh, demo gods are being a little angry with me there. So while that's coming up, though, let's kind of switch over. I want to show just a few other highlights. So in addition to defining kind of the full networking of the um, environment and the virtual images, we also have been looking at adding support for things like Windows, right? So being able to generate the right kind of user data script for Linux versus Windows. So that's something that we've seen. This is a little bit of a newer feature. And then also looking at composition. So particularly if I have a set of those specialist roles that are working together, I might have some of them create topologies that are just pieces of that overall solution. So for instance, the actual network topology is one piece. It doesn't include any virtual machines. And the application topology is a separate piece that has a reference to the network that is actually supplied as a parameter into it. And so again, this is kind of reflecting the organizational structure through the artifacts that are created. And from here, we'll actually be able to import the various pieces. Now, if I were doing this by hand, there's a lot of things you have to keep straight. So for instance, in this example, we have the one piece that we've imported and its various parameters. I can jump into the source very easily. I can see the content in the diagram very quickly. And we'll go ahead and save this. And then let's import the application piece. And so now we're pulling it in from one diagram. We can see all of the various segments of this heat architecture. If I select the target object, we're actually selecting the segments that are reflected in the diagram. 
all of the source that's required for both the nested pieces for the application topology, the network topology, and the piece here that's just simply referencing the building blocks is all located in one place. All right, any comments or questions so far? Yes. So this is part of that plugin architecture. Okay. So in addition to examples like the RDS or the Elasticache, where we're creating completely new resource types that never existed before, for all of the core types, like image, network, subnet, um, uh, block storage for Cinder, object storage for Swift, we've actually created a parallel architecture for EC2. Each of those types knows how to talk to the native Amazon API and enables us to create the heat template and read it. But when it's parsed in, we, we use the heat resource registry to bring our types in to actually execute it. And so the net of it is that as a user, I don't have to change the template. I might have a different configuration file, but the template itself remains the same with all the same content. So that's all happening at a heat stack layer, not in EC2? That's correct. If I ran this straight from heat stack create, all the same technology applies. Right, and then I can trigger it either from the designer or from the application view in that case. Under the covers, it's still the same heat engine that's executing. One more quick question. Sure. Um, does that mean that you're operating heat disconnected from, say, Keystone? Uh, no, heat still requires Keystone, but for the Amazon case, it simply does kind of the initial, can I accept this request? And then from there, each of the types know how to interact with the API key. That's part of what we're providing through this context in the top, understanding the cloud authorization. And so each cloud provider, like Amazon or SoftLayer or VMware, have their own slightly different set of parameters. We can pass those in as global parameters to the heat stack create so that it doesn't affect the template, and the types know how to interpret those. All right, so I'm slowing down a little bit here, unfortunately, but let me switch back over, because I want to also hit content around uh, Docker as well. So in addition to what I've shown you here, we've also been experimenting on Bluemix with containers and virtual images. So Bluemix, IBM Bluemix started out primarily as Cloud Foundry, but has been expanding quite a bit. What's neat about this is that, again, with this kind of DevOps question of what, how, and where, now we simply have more concise answers, right? Docker images form the what, the how are actually just simply running the Docker containers, maybe using Mesos or Kubernetes or something else to manage kind of the clustering and distribution. And ultimately, there's, there's some notion of where to deploy it. Now, in the simple case, you can go today. Everyone can actually go sign up for free and experiment with using the container service with your own built-in pipeline. So under this example, we actually have a build, staging, and production stage of the pipeline. We have a Docker repository that's backing the images. Uh, that are provided in this environment. You can build new images into it, and then you can define the process for how you promote it forward, binding it to IPs and routes as needed so you can expose that Docker-based application very quickly in the broader internet. Now, this works great for many use cases. It'll work great, particularly for experimentation and dev test. Um, you can also look at it longer term for production. It's still in beta, so I wouldn't recommend production now, but we'll get to that point. But the other context we see providing value is using the same notions of the application and the inventory that we were looking at here a moment ago, where I can actually click in and see each of my environments and see exactly what's deployed in those environments, right? the versions of software. But apply that to where I either push them out to the public registry and deploy it through the pipeline there, or push it into my actual local Docker environments where I'm actually running production workload. So, as we kind of expand past that, there's actually a lot of work we've done within Magnum, and I want to invite Tan up to, to show and talk about some of that. All right, Tan? Thanks, Michael. Um, OK, so my name is Tanyo. I'm uh, um, based out of uh, California at the IBM Silicon Valley Lab. I've been working on heat and lately uh, Magnum. So what I'd like to do is uh, take a few minutes to uh, uh, take a look at what's coming next in terms of uh, support for container in OpenStack. Uh, Magnum is a new project that just became an official part of OpenStack just about two months ago. Um, so uh, Magnum is a container as a service. So what it does is that it deploy a uh, cluster of hosts for you, and then uh, uh, the container we will be deployed on top of that cluster. And then after that, you can run your um, uh, lifecycle operation on your container like uh, pause, resume, update, and so on. 
Uh, the project is pretty act active. There are some 40 developers uh, contributing, and for the Kilo cycle, IBM did uh, uh, contribute quite a bit there. The, uh, there is a full talk and demo on Magnum by uh, Adrian Otto and uh, Stephen Dick, the PTL, on Thursday. So, so I, I won't steal their thunder here. But uh, what I'd just like to do is uh, to go through a short uh, example of how it works, and then we can talk about how uh, Urban Code Deployer can be yeah, uh, can, can, can support Magnum very nicely. Okay. Um, so a couple of very interesting things about Magnum is that uh, they do intend to support multiple backend and a different uh, uh, container manager like Kubernetes or Swarm. Okay. Now for hosting your container, you can run on your VM uh, in OpenStack. You, you can run on bare metal, and you can even run on on within the uh, uh, container if that makes sense. Now, for the context of what we talk about here, uh, what Magnum uh, help is uh, to to really help us in terms of orchestration. The uh, the container the container that Magnum create is a first class object in OpenStack, so that would make it uh, very e much easier to integrate with the op other service in OpenStack like uh, Keystone, Cinder, Neutron, and so on. The the uh, Container manager like uh, Kubernetes Swarm, they, they also handle a some level of orchestration on their own. So uh, Magnum, by interacting with those uh, manager directly, uh, basically it gives you two choices: you can work at the container level level just just like that, or you can uh, work at the full stack level, you know, container with full infrastructure uh, like networking and storage and so on. And and the the most important part is the last point that. Uh, all the artifacts that you create for you can your container, your YAML or JSON file, they are reused as is. There's no change. OK, so uh, I'll talk, walk through a quick example of how Magnum deploy WordPress with load balancer. Uh, this is very much a work in progress, uh, but it will show you, kind of uh, give you an idea of how it works. Right? Um, the, uh, um, for here, we, we are going to use a Kubernetes cluster. And the example uh, actually came from the the, the uh, Git repo for Kubernetes. Right? So first thing we do is uh, do a Magnum bake create. So what it does is that the Magnum will drive a set of heat template that goes out and create your cluster for you. So it would deploy the VM uh, that run the master node and the minion node and so on. It also deploy the neutron uh, networking, the subnet, the neutron, uh, the the router and so on. Uh, so next we do a pod create, and with that we give it the uh, the uh, YAML file that describes the pod. Right? So here, what it's going to do is bring up a Docker instance for MySQL. It will also attach a single volume to the, that the instance. Then next you run a service create, number three there, and you give it a, a, uh, uh, the YAML file that describes your your service. So service is a, a concept uh, that is specific to Kubernetes, but basically what it does is that it uh, uh, publish the port and IP that represent your database. Then we do another part query. Uh, we give it the, the YAML file that describes your WordPress and uh, we'll bring up the, the Docker instance for WordPress. Right? And then it will talk to the, the uh, MySQL instance. And then finally, we do a uh, the last service query that would uh, expose the WordPress instance to the uh, external internet. So what's interesting here is that the YAML for this the, the WordPress service uh, specify a load balancer. So what Kubernetes does is that they would talk to uh, Neutron in OpenStack and bring up the load balancer uh, that's sitting in front of the service. And, and then after that, the Kubernetes also uh, take care of managing the, the member for the load balancing pool and so on. So from this example, we see two key points. Right? So the first point is that we, we can do a really full uh, orchestration with, open, with container. And here we see that it's uh, integrated with the Keystone, Cinder, Nova, and Neutron. So that, that uh, plays pretty powerful. The second point is that the, the YAML file that you see here are uh, just artifacts that you uh, create from to describe your container. And they're just used here as is. Right? OK. So um, with that example, we can kind of envision how Urban Cloud deploy. Uh, can help uh, orchestrate container in OpenStack. Uh, so as we saw with the heat template that uh, Michael showed, um, 
we can drag and drop uh, the heat resource and, and edit them and so on. The five uh, magnum command that we saw in the last example is going to group, is going to become heat uh, resource, and you can treat them the same way. You can drag and drop and so on. The uh, manifest to re describe your container, we can envision that uh, uh, Urban Code Deploy can help, uh, can let the, the user edit them, and uh, going to provide support with uh, validation and hint and so on. Yeah, all the nice support for a tool. Right. And so with that, the uh, Urban Code Deploy would uh, take your description, your heat template, and then deploy onto your environment. Right. So for the uh, uh, looking ahead a little bit for the Liberty Cycle, uh, we think that the uh, we can expect that uh, Magnum will become uh, much more mature, and we think that uh, a lot of this support is going to come together very nicely. So with that, let me hand back to. All right, thank you, John. Appreciate it. So I think the the key thing I, I do want to point out in terms of availability and content. What I've shown up to this point with virtual images, that's actually part of what's available today. What we're talking about here is a little bit on the future side and kind of shifting into an understanding that there is some future content here. When we look at the heat template, we can also use today the native Docker Inc. container resource as part of a design as well. So I think when we look at Docker Compose, it's a great format for pulling together a bunch of containers to a complete system. I think heat brings some interesting additional capabilities, like being able to not only have Docker containers, but also perhaps bringing in things like object storage as part of that example. And so under the cover is this kind of Swift container or S3 container, um, bringing in additional networking, et cetera, um, allows you to put together architectures that aren't strictly just the application content from the container, but also begin to leverage these other things that are sort of outside of the traditional application box. Yes? Mm -hmm. portfolio, you previously show that um, given code deploy this pattern, then we'll be able to actually deploy the um, soft layer EC2 and uh, purification system and cloud orchestration. Mm -hmm. Sure, and a little bit of context there. So if folks aren't too familiar with the, the larger portfolio, Pure App and, and IBM Cloud Orchestrator have been around for longer than we've been involved before OpenStack was here, right? And so there is overlap in the technologies of how we describe patterns. Where we're headed, though, is all in on OpenStack and all in, in, in heat. And so there's already work underway to look at how do we take that content, which you know was maybe a little bit ahead of where the open community was back to 2008, 2009, and move it forward now. But a lot of this work is looking at where, not just where we've been, but how do we kind of get what we have and get it to where we need to be. I'm, I'm doing the question because I think it's um, what you just showed. Well, in terms we of need to have it um, the recording, so they need to ask the question into the mic. Gotcha. I can repeat the question if it's helpful. I know we're kind of sensitive on time. Is it okay if we table that just for a minute? I'll hit a couple more okay. slides and we'll talk right at the end. All right, so the key thing I wanted you to take away from this last segment is simply that not only do we anticipate having support for images, software, object storage, but also bringing in containers into it as well. As we look forward, I think we'll also see examples of things like Cloud Foundry, quite honestly, kind of coming into heat, being able to understand an application as sort of a black box that we can deploy alongside it. And so if I can move this along here a little bit. So again, the same kinds of questions, right? There's a set of artifacts. There's a way to deploy it. In that case, it's a CF push. It's a much simpler deployment model. But you still have artifacts. You still have configuration that you need to manage. Um, I have a couple of slides here on hybrid cloud that I don't have the time to cover. But I do want to get in a couple of quick plugs. One is there's lots of topics from IBM this week. So definitely do come check out some of the work we're doing. Um, we've made a huge investment in OpenStack, as many others have, and believe very heavily in it. The slides are already available on SlideShare if you want to download the link. Um, just a convenient way to get access to that. I'll give you a second to take a picture. And then the last thing I actually want to make sure I get out is that we're hiring. So if you're interested in joining our team, we would love to have you. Um, 
I'll move that back to the slide, but if you want to take a, a snapshot of this image, this uh, link as well, IBM Biz, UC Jobs for You, uh, to actually take a look at the recs we have available in both Cleveland and Raleigh, North Carolina. So we'd love to have you join our team. And I'll go back to the other one. So maybe that's a bad sign, but uh, okay. in either case, we'd love to have uh, some input. So um, we're going to be at the PED tonight, at the IBM PED, doing more demos, more content that I didn't have time to show here at 6 o'clock. And then my team will be available every day at 2 o'clock for the rest of the week at the IBM PED. So if you'd like to come by and talk to us, we'd love to have your input. Thank you.